Hello, I'm botanist Chris Benda, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about the topic of cadaver botany. A cadaver is a deceased human body, often used for you know, scientific purposes and things. So it's not really accurate to call plants cadavers, but of course it's a play on the word uh, to looking at plants during the dormant season. So in the months of November through, through March uh, in Illinois, plants are dormant. So they're not dead. If they're perennial plants, they've actually sequestered those sugars and, and put them back into the roots. So they're storing that energy underground and underground, the temperature is less variable so they can survive the winter well insulated in the ground. And the above ground portion of the plant is what um, becomes dormant. So you can call it dead, but it's, it's tissue that is, um, yeah, no longer active biologically. So the plant though is still alive underground unless it's an annual, in which case annuals of course live just a single year and the individual dies and then they rely on seeds to germinate into new plants the following year. So looking at perennial plants in the winter time is what we call cadaver botany. So I'm standing here in a big patch of diarena. This grass is called Diarena Americana, and another name is the American Beak Grass. So, kind of a funny name. I like to joke and say, whenever I see this grass, I just, I can't help but wanna touch the diarena, smell the diarena. Often there's just, there's so much diarena here in the woods. Ha ha ha. But this is a pretty distinct grass. Um, it has, you know, not a lot of leaves on the stem. It has hairy leaf base to it. The leaves often sort of flop over sideways. So you see the bottom part of the leaf. It's got a strong keel along the leaf as well. Um, and there is a similar species. It used to be a variety of this one, Diarena obovata. And that has really plump, short and, and wide uh, grains and, and seeds attached to them. These are much longer and leaner. Um, but they're both somewhat similar in the genus Diarena. So here we have another easy plant to identify, a very common native weed in Illinois that's called black snake root or Senicula canadensis. And this is in the carrot family, the APACE. Of course, carrot families have this umbel-like inflorescence. Think of an umbrella, right? Where we have all the parts of the umbrella that radiate from a central point. So they're often called umbellifers for that umbel shaped inflorescence. But also easily recognizable here are these little burr fruits. And I'm sure that you've had these attached to your clothes. They fall off and they stick very easily to animals or humans or fabric. And so they're dispersed that way. Here's another distinct plant a cadaver in the sense that it is a perennial plant that is herbaceous and has died back to the ground for the season and the remaining dead part of the plant is here is very conspicuous you can see that there are leftover parts of the fruit coming off here on these branches and that's all that we need to see to tell that this is the false nettle bomeria cylindrica of course, nettles are in the nettle family, the urticaceae, and I joke because when you touch them, they hurt. Oh, sometimes they hurt so bad. Here I am with a neat grass here that's called Dicanthelium boschii, or large fruited panic grass. And this is a true cadaver plant. It's a perennial grass, and all the chlorophyll has gone away and we're left with the brown dried up remnants of the above ground portion of the plant and we can notice that there's pretty wide leaves and very helpful there's a little hairy node with downward pointing hairs we call that retrorsely bearded big clue for this particular species and we can see remnants in the panicle of where the seeds were of course that's why they're called panic grasses it's a panicle is produced, a type of uh, inflorescence. 
Uh, of course, I like to joke there are so many and they can be difficult to identify and say, don't panic. We can figure this out. We'll work through the dicanthelium key. Of course, there is still the genus Panicum um, that is uh, like switchgrass and some other uh, common plants, but the dicanthelums were, were uh, taken out of that genus and placed in their own, and they actually flower in the spring and in the fall, which is kind of an interesting strategy for grasses. And another funny thing about the panic grasses um, is that this one is called the large fruited panic grass, and the fruits are, you know, more than two millimeters uh, long, and so that's considered big uh, for these grasses, and that's kind of a funny part there with the name. So another really helpful thing to look at in the dormant season to identify plants is bark. So typically trees are will be large enough to have a pronounced bark. Sometimes when they're young, it, they don't have the same characteristic look. So you want to look at mature specimens like this one behind me here. It has this very warty, corky bark all over it. And it is a hackberry tree, which is Celtis occidentalis. So very distinct, unmistakable bark on hackberry. And if you look at the ridges of the warts, the, the corky bark tissue up close, uh, they're layered. And so it looks like a sedimentary rock. I always joke it's like a miniature scene of Utah or some a state with a lot of uh, you know interesting rock formations um, of sandstone and various sedimentary rock. Some of my favorite plants to look at in the dormant season are woody plants, so trees and shrubs and sometimes vines. And so I have here behind me a little sapling, I would say, a small tree, and we can look at various clues and characteristics on it to determine what species it might be. So a big clue on this one is that it has opposite leaves. So the leaves, of course, have fallen off, but we can see the leaf scar, and the leaf scar indicates that this had an opposite leaf arrangement. So in Illinois, that really narrows down the options significantly. We can also see on this twig that it has clustered terminal buds. So that's another very helpful clue. And then also looking at the shape of the leaf scar, it's shaped like the letter D, kind of like a sideways D, uppercase D. Uh, and the leaf bud is positioned across the flat side, the upper portion of that leaf scar. And that will indicate that this is green ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica. So another useful feature to notice when looking at plants are the fruits many different types of fruit and this is spice bush spice bush has these red fruits and they're not berries they're actually droops so a droop is a fleshy fruit with a single seed inside so these pretty red droops are produced on the spice bush that's lindera benzoin and it is in the laurel family the Lauraceae, related to sassafras and both sassafras and spice bush have um, pleasant fragrance to them. And if you scratch and sniff this time of year, you can just scratch there and bring it up to your nose. Mmm, so there's a nice little lemony scent to it. So it's always fun to be able to use your nose to identify plants. So now I'm down here at the edge of the pond and looking at some different wetland species that like to have uh, you know, in or near water. Like this here, this is a cattail in the genus Typha. And these are the seeds. This is the female portion of the plant. The males are on top and they're done their thing and so they're long gone. And here's the, the seeds here that have this, whoa, cottony fluff there that comes off and will disperse. And so, you know, people joke that the inflorescence here kind of looks like a corn dog. Put the mustard on it. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But cattails are, are pretty distinct. And you can see why it gets that name there. With these the seeds that come fluffing out of the top and throughout there. So this is a monocot. It has a round stem. It has, you know, pretty distinct leaves here. They're very fibrous. And you can pull them apart in strips. 
and uh, the roots actually can be been eaten. I know I've never done that, but I've heard about that. So cattail is definitely an interesting and very easy to identify plant uh, along the water's edge. Now here's something I found just laying on the ground here in my yard. And it's just this little twig right here. And this you can identify at least to the genus uh, by just looking at the twig. So it has clustered terminal buds like we saw in the ash, but this is an alternate leaved um, plant. So that has a lot more options there, but with the clustered buds, that leads us to Quercus, which is the group of oaks. And these buds are quite rounded. So that suggests that it would be in the white oak group. And because I know the trees that grow around my house, I know this is from a post oak, but you could look at the bark of the trees here and identify the different oak species and perhaps come up with that idea. Of course, another thing to be would, you know, look at the ground and you can find, you know, leaves here that will suggest the species. And of course, many of these leaves are the classic post oak shape. So Quercus delata, post oak. So I'm standing here with an interesting plant called pokeweed or Phytolacca americana. And it is in its own family, the Phytolacaceae. And in Illinois, it is the only representative in that family. So this is a plant I think most people are aware of. You may have heard of poke salad. So the pioneers and settlers and uh, people who like to live off the land um, will eat this plant. And you actually take the fresh emerging shoots and you boil them many times. Uh, in order to eat them and because the plant is toxic all parts of the plant are poisonous to humans and so it's definitely one you want to be careful of uh, in fact i heard a story earlier this year at giant city state park which is nearby where i live here in jackson county uh, there was a family that their children all had purple all over their mouths and the mother said oh we found some elderberry that we've been eating and uh, no it wasn't elderberry it was pokeweed and the berries are poisonous so um, not it, they didn't ingest a deadly amount, thankfully, but it's important to be aware of the plants that are around in the landscape, especially if you're going to be eating them. So even though it is the dormant season and most plants are dormant, um, not everything. There's some species that actually still photosynthesize or in this case uh, are especially adapted for wintertime growth. And here is a leaf that's green in the forest floor that are very common in Southern Illinois, especially this time of year when most things are brown. And this is new growth for this year. This leaf has just emerged for the winter to photosynthesize. So this is the putty root orchid, also called Adam and Eve orchid, a plectrum hymali, of course in the orchid family. And this species produces a single leaf per plant, uh, usually around November, and they photosynthesize through the winter. They have adaptations that allow them to make use of the cold temperatures where usually photosynthesis struggles um, for most plants in the winter, which is one reason why they go dormant. But this can handle that. And uh, it will then, the leaf will wither away in the spring. And then when they flower in early May, um, there will be a single stalk of sort of maroonish, yellowish uh, flowers. And what's interesting is that in the wintertime, the dormant season here, and you wander through the woods, you can actually see lots of putty root orchid leaves. Now, not every leaf is going to produce a flowering stalk, but um, this is such a common plant that, you know, you go out in May and you think, okay, I, I'm, all these places, it seemed like it was really common for a putty root orchid, and the flowers are so hard to see that time of year because everything is turned green and lush. You know, usually, at least in Southern Illinois, end of April, early May, things are pretty much fully leafed out and there's such a burst of green that you don't see the, the leaves, you just look for those, those sort of maroon, uh, somewhat inconspicuous uh, flowering stalks and they're really hard to find. You know, I have patches where I know I've seen leaves and, and I look for a while and then, oh, there's one there, oh, there's another one and they just really blend in. So very conspicuous. Uh, in the winter time, but not so much in the spring. 
Here's another grass, one of my favorites for sure. And it is called Dicanthelium laxiflorum. And it always tends to have this real, you know, floppy, sprawling uh, form to the growth. And so I like to call it Dicanthelium relaxiflorum because it's relaxed. Or sometimes I refer to it as the Snoop Dogg grass because it's laid back with my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Dicanthelium laxiflorum. One thing that you can use to identify it easily, kind of hard to see on these you know, shortened stalks, but they have hairs that point downward on the stems. It's a little tough to see this time of year, but it's such a distinct plant, so common in the woods. You know, it, it, it should be going dormant, even though it's you know generally still pretty green here. In Southern Illinois, you know, we have pretty, um, mild winters and so a lot of plants can stay green a little longer you know the frost hasn't occurred yet so that's another reason why some things are still green here's another really common tree in illinois called sycamore at least here in the southern part of the state it is and it's really an easy one to identify um, even with their young trees here it has very distinct bark of course where it's very flaky and peely and they have you know white um, branches that are underneath so if it's a large specimen you can easily identify it by its bark but there's a couple other really useful clues here and one of them here is you look at this little leaf tissue or like on this one here it is this is a stipule okay and they're deciduous they come off so a stipule is a modified leaf and it's basically at the leaf attachment and so on this species, when the stipule falls off, it leaves a stipular scar. And it's basically a little ring that wraps all the way around where the bud is. Okay, the stipular scar. So that's a really useful clue on sycamore. Here's a good example. You can see that scar, that line wrapped right away, all the way around. That's where the stipule used to be attached and has fallen off. And that's back here on this branch. Also, if you look at the individual uh, leaf buds, you can see it's got a, a, a pretty big reddish bud to it, but the leaf scar actually wraps all the way around the bud. So it's you know inside of the petiole when the leaf is attached. So that's a really distinct uh, feature for sycamore and a few other things like the yellow wood and uh, leatherwood and um, and the sycamore here. So Platinus occidentalis is <clears throat> the sycamore. This is one of my favorite shrubs called Viburnum refugulum or rusty black haw and it is in the adox ACE along with elderberry and that's how it fits in the buck made scat because it does have an opposite leaf arrangement. So that narrows down any woody species in Illinois with opposite leaves. We say buck made scat and the A of the scat is for the adox ACE, which includes viburnums. And there are different kinds of viburnums. There's nanny berry and uh, arrowwood and such. So it's a neat genus. And I like to joke and say, hey, I saw these guy, this guy burning these uh, black haw twigs. And I said, hey, viburnum. Another thing you can look at here are the fruits, of course. And here are some of the dark fruits hanging on the tree. And so these are droops. Again, a droop is a fleshy fruit with a single seed inside. Okay, so droops are the fruit type for the viburnum. Also, it has pretty distinct buds. They're really dark brown, hence the rusty uh, black haw in the name, see opposite branching, and they're often, you know, covered in um, little rusty hairs. So, you see a couple right there as well. So, really easy one to identify. One of my favorites is a bunch of it growing near my home here in Jackson County, and it has this brilliant color. Oh, and the flowers, I and mean, they bloom for a short period of time, but they're really. Uh, prolific especially when they get sun 
huge blooms of white flowers. They're fragrant. They're just gorgeous. So be sure to check that out sometime on the Viburnum refugium. So again, a clue to be on the lookout for to identify plants in the dormant season are fruits or remaining fruits. And we can see here some legumes that are hanging off of this species. And so the legumes generally belong to the pea family, the Fabaceae. And this one here is actually called red bud or Circus canadensis. And so they have these, you know, pretty small, short uh, legumes and they're often very persistent. So the seeds would be inside. Of course, the legumes are the nitrogen fixers, which is very important that, you know, plants need nitrogen um, to grow. And it's, a, it's common in the atmosphere, but limited, um, you know, in the soil. And so it's very useful to have these nitrogen fixing plants like soybeans that can put nitrogen in the soil. So very useful in that regard. Um, and of course, these have the beautiful pink flowers that, you know, bloom prolifically in the early spring. So that, another neat thing. Also with the red bud, the twigs are often in a very zigzag shape. So you can kind of see here how there's a little bit of a zigzagging to the twig here. So I spied these neat looking fruits hanging from this tree and they belong to the wild yam, Dioscorea velosa. Of course, Dioscorea is named after Dioscorides, who was one of the first people to actually name plants and write them down in a systematic way. Of course, it was for medicinal use. But this has a very distinct capsule to them. They're like three angled and they split open and seeds are inside. So they're really distinct kind of cute little fruits to look at. And this is a dioecious species, which means that an individual is either male or female, but not both. So obviously the fruits are produced on the female trees that produce female flowers. And so this is a female specimen here. Here's a common tree species that's pretty much in every woods, very common in Illinois, called box elder. The box elder is a type of maple with the name Acer nagundo. And maples are in the Sapindaceae by most authorities. And what's really helpful for identifying this tree is looking at the twigs. So I have a twig here, and you can see that it's green. Not a lot of trees, twigs are green, particularly in the dormant season. So you know, like Euonymus atroperporeus would be one that's often green or sassafras. But this one here, we can see that there was a leaf attached to the stem on that side and then directly across it on the other side. So that tells us it was an opposite leaf arrangement. So that narrows things down again, buck made scat. So the made, the M is maple, and that would include this group. You can even see that sometimes the branches are opposite as well as the leaves. So you can definitely recognize that feature. Now here's a plant that is all over in the woods and roadsides where I live. And it is called Elemis villosus, the villus wild rye. Of course, with the wild rye genus Elemis, I joke, like in the movie, The Big Lebowski, Donnie, you're out of your Elemis. And there are a number of species, and because the glooms stay attached to uh, the axis of the inflorescence, it makes them easy to identify later in the year. So, kind of a gloomy plant with all the glooms. So they are long awns. We'd say that there are awns on this grass. Um, and that's helpful to see the awns and the glooms and the nodding inflorescence there and very hairy leaf sheaths and very hairy glooms too. And that leads us to our silky wild rye, uh, Elemis velosus identification. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on cadaver botany. 
and I hope I've inspired you to look at plants in the wintertime. Thank you.